And so we were in the middle of some changes and some um, reorganizations of the company I was working for and things were, yeah, here, we're still here. We have a job. And so um, I was already roasting coffee um, because I was tired of the bad coffee we had at the office. And so I was the sometimes jerk that would, you know, I was, I was the guy that brought a little box of coffee that I roasted the night before, two nights before. And I'd fill up my little Keurig refillable cup and I'd brew my cup and you could smell it throughout the entire facility. Then every now and then I'd bring it and I'd put brew pots. And so, you know, we went and we did that for a while. And then we said, hey, um, as my friends started asking for more of the coffee that I was going, that I was able to make, I wasn't gonna turn down my friends. And so we started, we bought a small commercial roaster. Uh -huh. And then when we bought the small commercial restaurant, we went, huh, can we make this pay for itself? And so we started selling at a farmer's market. And we started selling out at the farmer's market. And so then we went, huh, okay, now I'm back to roasting three hours a night on the small commercial roaster. So can we get a bigger commercial roaster that doesn't break the bank? And so we did parallel um, both of them for a while and, and things change and things happen. And sometimes you make a, make a life decision in where you're going to go. And so we decided to give the coffee business a shot for a while. And, and right now we're in five coffee shops here in, in the Lubbock and Panhandle region. A um, couple of restaurants, a couple of uh, private clubs, several offices are using our shop, our coffee as their, as their appreciation to their, to their, not only their customers, but their employees. Instead of having bad coffee, just to keep them awake, they give them a little bit better coffee to keep them awake and keep them happy. <laughs> and so, um, it's just continually growing little by little um, back to where I'm roasting twice as many hours on my big roaster that I was when we bought it with twice the size load per time. And so we're getting to the point where just about having to put in another day of roasting to keep up with some of the orders. Wow. Yeah. So why is your cup of coffee the best cup of coffee in the world? Because I roasted it. Because you <laughs> <laughs> So we source our beans. We source our beans from, um, based on quality and quality that we can afford and quality that our customers want to afford. So there's, there's other qualities out there that we can go and say, hey, this is up here. And um, then we have to still make money doing it. And our customers are going to know we're not going to pay $30 for a pound of coffee. Um, and there's some out there that are that way. Um, and yes. <laughs> and, um, and so, but it's the roast that I put onto it. So we don't just throw, throw coffee into the roaster and go with it. Back to my scientific background. I look at the scientific method each time I get a new coffee and start a roast and say, okay, this is the hypothesis for it. What do I want to, what do I want to achieve? This hypothesis is how I get it. And I go through multiple different iterations before I settle on, hey, this is it. So um, that's, that is what we do and how we make our coffee so good. And part of it is, is just bringing in darn good coffee on the beginning. So people ask all the time, well, do you have bad coffee? I was like, yeah, I've had bad coffee. Every time I get a first roast of a new coffee, it becomes a bad coffee because it only goes up from there. But I always say that you can make a good coffee bad by roasting or brewing but it's very difficult to make a bad coffee on the front end good either way. So starting off with the good coffee is what makes it good. So how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? Oh, anywhere from three to nine or 10 or 12. It depends if we're profiling out espresso. If we're just profiling out, if we're just profiling out black coffee, yeah, anywhere from three to nine. If we're doing espresso, and making a blend or trying something new out on it. Um, if I drink drank the entire shots, it could be 12 to 15. Um, so I did that one time where I drank the entire shot of every one I made. And it was six o'clock at night when I finished up and I, I was about nine shots into it. And I didn't sleep until about three in the morning. 
And so I learned what my limitation was, was just a couple of sips and it's okay to dump things out. It's okay to not drink everything. And so um, when it, it's a lot more fun drinking everything, but it's okay to not. So. so you're jacked up on caffeine all the time, all day long, right? I, I've actually, in the last three months, started regulating it more um, just because um, I don't want to desensitize myself to it to where I have to drink more and more and more to have the same effect. So I've tried to push back a little bit and limit it. Um, so when morning, my wife doesn't drink coffee. So I don't have a big 12 cup coffee pot. I don't see the need for it because I'm not gonna drink that much at one time. So I use a pour over system where I grind a little bit different and I have a lot of control over how I brew my coffee. So I have temperature control, grind size control, how fast I pour versus how slow I pour. And so I may, it makes about three cups and that's my morning. And then I may make another one um, in the afternoon. If I'm expecting visitors at the shop, then I'll brew a pot and if they show up, they show up and that's great. And they drink part of it and I drink the rest of it. And if they don't show up, I drink most of it. And so it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a tough call. And then we get out there and then it's, well, tell me about the espresso. And we start going through things and, and then it gets wild. So. So has COVID-19 affected your business? It did on the very beginning. It, well, and, and through the entire thing. So our largest customers are our coffee shops. And the first few weeks, everybody wasn't pumping brakes, they were slamming on brakes. And so volume, roasted volume, uh, went down considerably for the first few weeks. And it started, um, it started stair-stepping back up. And so we are not quite at parity where we were pre-COVID, um, but we're getting close. And so it's, we've been at this place before um, through our growth and now it's a matter of adding in more to where we come out on a higher end, so. So did you pivot your business at all during COVID or did you just keep the same sort of business plan? We kept mostly the same sort of business plan. We've added in a couple of other products and are continually adding in products beyond coffee. So we look at it and, and on the wholesale side, it's really easy and we're talking about how to do it on the retail side and what we want to have and what, how we want to market it. But to our wholesale customers, we have a call, we have teas available as well. And well, we're trying to look at it and say, can we have this as a one-stop shop for a coffee shop? So um, teas, we have a chai line that we have. Um, we're looking at a couple different things. I was contacted by a paper goods about being a distributor for them. Again, building on to what do we have to have to be a one-stop shop for these coffee shops that are around here. That way, if we have everything that they need at the right price, maybe they don't have to pay their online distributor for their $99 a month so they get free shipping when it's here locally. They realize that they misordered something and they're two days out on shipping. Well, you know what, I'm right here and we have it. And so that's what, that's what our goal is. And so making, trying not to make the wrong decision sometimes on what to bring in is the hardest part and slows you down, right? So you don't want to make a wrong one. So you just kind of keep the brakes, riding on the brakes and go, no, no, no. And so the teas on the retail side, I think we figured out the teas yesterday. Uh, so those will be hopefully in the next couple of weeks coming up online. Um, but in looking at that really, adding the teas onto the retail side is 100% a description of my wife and I, right? So she doesn't drink coffee, but she drinks tea uh -huh. and she's been introduced to different teas. So if I sit back and say to a couple and say, do I start bundling things to where you have a coffee tea bundle, especially those that pair up well together. Yeah. And so um, that's what we're working on. That way, that way maybe, on the on the online side that we can sit back and have a larger presence than two because it's something for them to get it makes it a little bit nicer deal for them to get something for both spouses at the same time wow now does your wife drink green tea no she's more of a black tea um, um more herbals um i think i've worked with her on greens and i haven't got the brew down right she doesn't like um what she says is the bitter, um, but then again, 
a friend of mine is um, a professor at Texas A&M here in Lubbock. And when he makes his yearly trip home to China, or when he has made his yearly trip home to China, he always br brings back some green tea for me. And um, he brought some back one day. It was in a disc about this big. It looked like a disc that you would have thrown in high school. Uh -huh. And it was compressed, and he just broke me off a piece of it. And I was on my way out in plant breeding. In my plant breeding career, I was fortunate to be able to travel the world. Uh -huh. So um, passports are filled up with stamps from all over the place. And um, on my way out of the country, he gives me this and puts it in a little yellow craft envelope and says, take this with you and drink it. It's going to be some of the best. And so I start looking at it going, wait a second. This doesn't look good. I have this green leafy stuff that's pressed into a cake in a little paper bag in my bag going through the airport. <laughs> uh, but it was phenomenal tea. It was absolutely phenomenal. It was fresh. It was some of the best green teas I'd ever had. And that, then I started working with other fellows, international fellows, and they bring back stuff from their countries for me all the time. Green teas, white teas, red teas, um, chais from India, just absolutely phenomenal flavors that we can't have here. And so it's not online yet. One of the things when we're out at the farmer's market that we have is a, is a sticky chai uh -huh. that you actually have to brew it. I mean, it's, you put it in hot steaming water, then you put in and heat up the milk with it and let it sit there and steep and then you filter it out. And it's a flavor profile that you don't get out of a bag or out of a pre-mixed thing, instant type drink. And so the few Indian um, you know, friends that I have is like, here, try this, like, oh man, that's really good. And so it's not what you're expecting. It's not a super duper sweet one like what you get at Starbucks uh -huh. or or one of the tea um, the tea restaurants here. Um, but it's a great balance of spice and sweet. Wow! Now tell me, when was that moment that you just fell in love with coffee and thought, I'm going to change the world with my coffee? Oh shoot. Changing the world with my coffee? No, I don't want to change the world. I want to change somebody's life, not the world. One life at a time is all it is. But um, when I had that moment of I can do this was in, let's see, we're in 20, 19, 18. In 2017, I was coming through Temple and um, ended up down in um, Belton at Arusha's Coffee House. Uh -huh. And Arusha's coffee house roasts their own as well. And that was my first, I had had locally roasted coffee here from one of the coffee shops, but it wasn't the same. Whatever reason was that Ethiopian Arar that I'd gotten from Arusha's was that coffee that went, oh my. And it, then it became a, another science project of, hey, can I do this? And then working through things. And so, yeah. And then it, then it, as, as I started getting stuff out to friends and friends saying, hey, this is really good, Carrie, or especially when I run out going, man, I wish we had that one again. That makes me feel like, hey, I did something right. Uh -huh. And so that, ha and that happened this week. One of my coffees, my Peruvian coffee that I had, I got to deliver my last bag, my last retail bag of it. And it was a night that we had storms coming through and uh, you asked about pivots. That was one of the pivots we did during COVID is we started offering local deliveries for our coffees. So if we have it on the shelf and it's ordered today, it will be delivered this evening on your porch in a box. I ring the doorbell, I walk away, send you a note that it's ready. And so that coffee in particular, that was the last retail bag. I could not replace it if I had to. And I left it on the porch, rang the doorbell, walked away, and I was going to send her a note anyways that says, hey, um, this is the last one. I hope you enjoy it. We're looking for others, and I was delayed in sending that, and, and in the meantime, thunderstorms had built up and run through the area, dropping upwards of an inch of rain and other things as well, and I went, had this sinking feeling of, oh my goodness, I hope she got that note. I hope she got her coffee off her porch before this hit because there was enough rain that went through there that um, that box was going to be ruined, which was going to ruin the bags inside. And oh, goodness, goodness, goodness. And so I sent out a long email and said, hey, we, 
one of our copies, we, we, it went away, but we substitute it with a really similar product. I hope you enjoyed it. If not, let me know, we'll replace it with something else. The other one is the last, this is the last retail bag. Um, congratulations. Um, and then the other, then the last point on that note to her was, um, oh yeah, if you didn't get this in in time, if it got wet, if these products are damaged, please let me know so that way we can go ahead and replace it and we can start working in. And I had a line on where one of the bags of Peru might be um, that I could probably get and I'd have bought it off the shelf at that retailer out of my pocket and replaced it just because. Um, but she was able to get it in and everything in time before the rain started. So I was very pleased on that. <laughs> so, yeah. So you have like a couple of different business models within your coffee business. You have business, you have coffee to consumer, and then you also have coffee to business. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we have, we have a B2C and a B2B business. Um, the B2C is a lot of fun because I get to interact with a lot of people. Um, mama, my mother always told me, said, you are more of an extrovert than what you think. Naturally, I feel more of an introvert. My safe place is being in the corner and watching everybody if we're in a crowded room. And over the last two years, I've learned how to take myself out of that corner and start visiting and meeting people and quote unquote mingling, right? Uh, different things. And so the B2C to, the B to model, I have to be in contact with lots and lots and lots and lots of people. And when we started this, that contact with lots of people was so stressful. I was on so much adrenaline going through that, that after a four hour farmer's market, but all of us, my, myself, my wife, my son, we would come home and we would take anywhere from a three to four hour nap to work off all of that adrenaline. And over those two years, it's changed so much, but it's still a, hey, how many people do I have to be in contact with? And so the B2B model allows me to allow somebody else to be in contact with more people than what I'm able to do. So one of the coffee shops is a very high volume shop. <clears throat> I don't want to take anything away from there because they have their clientele that come in there. They have new clientele all the time. And so through them, I get to be in contact with them. And so the B2B for me really gives me a a, another arm, another um, marketing point for Tiedas Planus Roasters. So that, that model right there has to be in there, short of me opening up a coffee shop. But then if I open up a coffee shop, I have to be extremely cognizant of where I open it because I don't want to compete against myself across town. Yeah. I have to make sure that I am outside of their reach of all the shops that I service so that way I, I don't start drawing people in. So, so yeah, so the, the, B2, the B2C is website and farmer's market and the B2B is everywhere around. Now, do you have a coffee shop right now or not? Um, at the farmer's market, we, have, we operate as a coffee shop. Okay. So every Saturday we set up, I wanna call it full service, but it's like a three quarter service. So you can get limited flavors of drinks, um, espresso drinks all day long, um, drip coffee. We offer our teas out there to drink. And so that's how we're set up. And so we have both a, a wet coffee revenue and a dry coffee revenue out of the market. And so that, that allows us a little bit more flexibility on how each week goes. And we get to interact with more people that way as well. So back to the interacting people with stress level, um, we kind of self-inflicted that um, because now it's not just the people that are going, no, nah, no, no, no. Now it's, hey, I just want a cup of coffee. Yes, coffee is great, but I just want a cup today. And so then it's, okay, how do we make a latte? And so our very first part of that last year when we started that was pretty ugly. It was really ugly. Um, it was a lot of fun learning, but we got to the point where <clears throat> we had to call somebody in and say, okay, I need to know what I'm doing wrong in this because something's not right. And it was one of those things you, we watch YouTube video after YouTube video after YouTube video of, of different steps of steaming the milk, of pouring, of doing this. 
and it was uh, following the steps, but it wasn't exactly, there was like a little hiccup that had to happen. And when that hiccup happened, everything flowed and it flowed perfectly. But it wasn't until somebody was there and actually holding onto my hand and going, now do that. And then everything went, oh, now we got it. Yeah. And so we've had, we've had fun in Lubbock. There's been a couple of um, latte art competitions, uh, some of the shops. And we've gone and participated. We've had pe some of the people know us at the shops. And some of them don't. They're looking at us like, uh, who are you? And why are you here? And why is there? A and then the funnier thing is, why is there a 13-year-old kid here trying this? And so, <clears throat> um, so yeah, so it's, it's a lot of fun taking, taking our son, taking him to, to that. He's learned a lot in how to operate on the barista end of it. Does he drink coffee? He does some. Um, he's not as opposed to it as my wife, but he doesn't just sit down and drink a cup of coffee. He will, he will go through and sample things with me. He'll, he'll drink lattes and he'll make, you know, especially cold drinks with cold brew. He'll make him a drink like that, uh, mainly milk based type drinks, um, just to cut down on some of the bitters for him. So if you were to have a cup of coffee of your choice, what kind of coffee would you have and what would you put in it? So one of my favorite coffees has always been some of the Ethiopians. I like the floralness of it. I like the fruitiness of the ones that I've gotten. Um, it typically, I'm a black coffee guy. I typically don't put anything in it. Um, if I put something in it, that's generally because there's something that I need to correct in there. Um, so milk will correct some of the, uh, some of the bitter on there. Sugars will do the same things. And so um, more or anything, it's just to enjoy the flavor and the texture that's there for me. And that goes all, do what? Do you ever ice it like your son? Not hot. If I cold brew, I will definitely. So I, I'm one that I have a friend that he likes to brew a pot of coffee and then ice the entire thing. And that's what he drinks. Uh -huh. uh, not so much that way. I, I subscribe more to cold brew and then from there drinking it. Sometimes it's just straight up black, but the cold brew is one that I'll add more to me. It becomes more of a, um, I call them desserts to where I add some sweeteners into it and I add some, some milk and I add the other things to make it, make it a little bit heavier. Uh, most of the time if I'm doing that, I'm adding half and half, sometimes heavy cream, but just to change the texture a little bit and to make it more like a dessert for me. So. So are you only in the Lubbock area? Um, I, if nobody's ever been to Lubbock before, so Lubbock is like this little, it's not a little town, it's a big town, but it's out there in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's no other towns really, like Waco, so, we have five towns around us and Austin's an hour away. Lubbock's right, so right, Carrie? Austin is closer to you guys than our nearest big town. So we're two hours from Amarillo, we're two hours from Midland Odessa, we're about five hours from the Metroplex, um, which gives us which gives us about two hours to Abilene as well. So, so we're, some people say, hey, we're right in the middle of the best fishing in the world here in Lubbock. You gotta drive five hours in any direction and you're gonna have some of the best fishing in the world, but we're right in the middle of it. Um, so, <laughs> so um, how do people find us? Um, we look at it and we're online. Um, hopefully somebody, somebody sees something that you may have liked on one of our Facebook posts and one of your friends sees that and then they follow us and they find us and link back to our webpage and products can be purchased out of our Facebook store as well. Um, so that end of it is word of mouth. Um, and we've done some targeted ads in different places um, through, through marketing on Facebook, got some really crazy reviews because of that, not because of coffee. I mean, there were some, there were some people that were up late at night and were aggravated because our ad showed up in their free Facebook feed. And I thought about sending them a note that says, you're welcome for, for our supporting your free Facebook um, habit. Uh, <laughs> but I was told not to do that too. Uh, <laughs> so our marketing got 
lady at Amy Wood at Flint Avenue uh, Marketing, she came up with an even better response. So it was quite, it was a lot of fun. Um, so, but we've done some targeted, targeted ads um, to different, um, different markets and different things. And so that's the biggest thing is just getting it out there little by little. Uh oh, I lost sound. So you'll ship anywhere. I will ship anywhere. Yes. Um, so I've I've shipped um, had the privilege of shipping coffee to friends um, continually in Seattle because they say it, it's better than anything they can get up there fresh roasted. Um, so that makes me feel good. And then the same thing um, to me. There's really in the U.S. There's Seattle is a hot spot for roasting. San Francisco is a really big hotspot for roasting. Minneapolis is a really big hotspot for roasting. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so I've had the privilege of sending, it, it is, and they love their coffee up there. And so I've had the pr privilege of sending coffee to both places, to both of the Northern places continually. So knowing that I have that kind of presence uh, in my qualities there to, to meet with them, I'm enjoying life right now. Have you ever been to a grocery store in Minnesota? No, I haven't. Do you know they have their milk in bags? I have heard that. I have heard that though. Um, some of the coffee shop owners in one of the Facebook groups I'm in has commented that they, they have to, the new, um, the new shop owners had to figure out how to handle bags versus jugs. And so, um, but supposedly the waste is less. Um, so. I guess so. It's just, you know, from us down south, we're like, when did they jug? So about 15 years ago, we did a, my wife and I were fortunate to take a vacation in Australia for about a week or so. We rented a house and rented a house. Well, we got to go to the grocery store, found the milk, no problem. It took us 30 minutes to find the eggs. They were in a regular aisle right next to the bread, non-refrigerated eggs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as they're not refrigerated, they have about a week's lifespan on them. Once you refrigerate them, then you take them out. You got to do that. And so, but the U.S. regulations say they have to be refrigerated. So, unless you're getting them straight from the farm, I guess. But the same way at my parents' house in Ecuador. Um, they buy their eggs and they're just sit on the counter for, for the week or so that they have them. Well, I guess, you know, we live in Texas and if you have chickens and they lay eggs, you don't have to be there like and catch the egg as it falls out. It can sit out. That's right. That's right. That's right, but if you're down there where you are in the summertime, and your summertime starts a lot earlier than my, mine up here typically, and you let it sit out there for very long, um, you might end up with something you don't like. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you planning on expanding your roasting of coffee to coffee shops outside of the Lubbock area in the future? I would love to. And, and so the farthest reach we have right now is Amarillo. Uh -huh. And so there's a coffee shop up there that we utilize, that utilizes our coffee. Um, talking with another one that's further north in Amarillo right now. Um, and then <clears throat> it's a matter of getting out into and being interacting and finding the right person within a shop, whether it's the owner or the general manager of a shop. Because if, if you have a successful shop, hopefully you have a successful roaster behind you. Uh -huh. And so I have to go in there with two opportunities in front of me, right? I have to go in there with just blind and say, hey, here I am, here's my coffee, let's give it a shot and see what you guys think. Or I have to have knowledge that a coffee shop is not happy with their roaster and are dealing with things. And I've been in two situations where that's, I've been able to walk right in and say, here we go, and they go, oh my gosh, this is great. Here we go, we're going. Um, so there's a couple of different things, or they have to be opening up. So if I get lead on a coffee shop that's opening up, it's a lot easier, especially if I can be there and visit with them on the front end uh -huh. um, about the coffees, to, to be able to work through that. But it's still a very competitive marketplace for, for roasters and for coffee. And so you have to, have to just get to know people and keep visiting with them and keep visiting with them and keep giving them products over and over and over. 
and just keep your foot in the door so that way whenever somebody is unhappy with the current roaster or something happens, they run out of their favorite coffee um, or what have you, then, then you're able to, to um, provide them with some level of product anyways. Well, Carrie, I want people to be able to get a hold of you if they want to get a hold of you as a consumer um, to get coffee or a business to get coffee. How can they get a hold of you? So all of our contact info is at tprcoffee.com. So Tango Pop, Papa Robert Coffee.com. <clears throat> or if you really want to have a spelling bee challenge, it's tiaspanosroasters.com. So. <laughs> So, but um, all of our contacts there, we have some information about our um, wholesale side and about our office coffee. And then all of our coffees have profiles available so you can look through and see um, what you're getting, whether it's a lighter roast with um, a, high, a brighter acidity and a lot more fruity tones to a darker roast um, that's more chocolates and so forth. Um, and then on that is contact info as well. So that's the easiest one. Or directly is Carrie at tiedasplanusroasters.com. So now before I end the interview, I always like to ask everyone a strange kind of question that's off the cuff. So okay. if you were on a deserted island and all of your human needs were met, everything was taken care of, but you could take two other things with you, what would be those two other things and why? Oh, if all of my human, if all of my living things were taken care of, um, I would take my wife. As long as I could take another person, I'd take my wife because she keeps me going straight and keeps me, um, my thought process sometimes goes all the way around and she goes, wait a second, just stop and relook at yourself and what you're doing. And does that meet um, what you need? Um, <laughs> so I would have to say her definitely. Um, and, oh shoot, what else would I take? Because I'm assuming that all of my needs are met, includes having coffee and a coffee pot. So, <laughs> and if not, I would say an endless supply somehow of coffee. Um, but if that wasn't, it, if that was included in that, oh, probably a fishing pole. Yeah. It's relaxing. It's frustrating as all get out fishing is because you want to catch something, but at the yeah. same time, it's relaxing. And so um, that fishing pole, it, it gives you time to think. It's depending on the water and where you're at, sometimes it's like playing chess. You make a move and then the fish makes a move. And then you try to anticipate what the fish is gonna do next. And then you make that next move. And so it can be a, a sport. It can be a relaxing activity. It can be a, a different source of food. So give me an option to have something other than what I would have with all the needs being met. So that's what I say, a fishing pole. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for joining me on Ask an Expert, uh, the Sometimes Spouse podcast. I feel like I know a lot more about coffee and tea having you on the podcast. You have an amazing day and thank you listeners for listening to the Ask an Expert podcast by Sometimes Spouse. Well, thank you for having me today. This has been a lot of fun talking about coffee and tea and fishing poles, apparently.